Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Besorat Emet Vechaye Davar Chaye Shalach Betochenu Baruch Ata Adonai Mevi Hamashiach Amen. Good job. Thank you, Shira. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful job. All right. <laughs> The Joiner Sisters. All right. <laughs> That's not all of them. Uh, the, at this time, we'd like to, um, uh, we're going to hear some from Aviva as she, she uh, dolesh, dolesh it, as she, she gives us a little uh, explanation, a little uh, context for our readings. I want to invite her right back up, and she's going to teach us a little bit. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you all for coming today. You may have noticed that my Besoya passage that we read today is all about Shabbat. So today, I want to do something a little bit different from the normal Bar and Bat Mitzvah Josh and expand on that passage by talking about Shabbat in general, and then we'll see how this theme connects to my readings. I'm excited about this message because Shabbat has always been special to me. So let's head back to preschool and unpack the five W's of Shabbat. Who, what, when, where, and why. We'll begin with when. God first talks about Shabbat in Genesis 2-2. God completed on the seventh day his work that he made, and he ceased on the seventh day from all the work that he made. So Shabbat is on the seventh day. More specifically, Jewish tradition decided that Shabbat would be a 25-hour weekly holy day. Let's unpack that. The MJRC, or Messianic Jewish Rabbinical Council, explains it like this. According to the Jewish reckoning of time, day begins at night. Jewish tradition recognizes a transitional period between day and night that is technically neither day nor night. This is the period that commences with the setting of the sun and concludes with the appearance of the stars. In Hebrew, this period is called Bien Hashmashot, the time between the suns. Because the Bien Hashmashot is unclear, Jewish tradition decided that Shabbat would start when the sun disappears from view behind the horizon, even though it would still be light. Further, in keeping with the rabbinic value of creating a fence around the Torah and adding to the holy rather than taking away, Jewish tradition adds an additional 18 minutes before sunset. One reason for this is in numerical Hebrew, 18 is the number for chai, which means life. There are also different time standards for when Shabbat ends. Times range from 42 minutes to 72 minutes, but the basic idea is to see three stars in the sky. So the minimum time for Shabbat is 18 minutes before and 42 minutes after sundown, which makes 25 hours. The reason I'm sharing this point is because I believe that it's important to expand on Shabbat to include the entire day from Friday night to Saturday night, and that the value of creating a fence around the Torah and adding an extra hour is one way we show our devotion and trust to God and His commandments. Now that we've gone over when, let's look into where. Where may seem like a strange question to ask for something like Shabbat. Shabbat is a time, not a thing, right? The MDRC actually does say something about the where for Shabbat. They talk about where to be and where not to be. The principle is called Shavut, or keeping the spirit of Shabbat. So even when it may not strictly be work, we don't want to be out in public places where others are not keeping Shavut, the spirit of Shabbat. For example, we wouldn't go out to the mall or to a restaurant, even if we aren't the ones buying, because the principle of Shavut still stands. Now, that doesn't mean we should stay home all day. Shabbat is the time to be with community at synagogue or at someone else's house for Shabbat dinner. Here at Ruach, us and a few other families and friends have been hanging out at the synagogue into the evening, sometimes even to Havdalah, because that's, Shabbat, that's what Shabbat is really for, to be with community. And even more than where we are during Shabbat, Abraham Joshua Heschel describes Shabbat as a palace in time which we must build. Now let's look into why. God makes it very clear that Shabbat is an important part of Jewish life. 
It's mentioned 27 times as a command over the course of the Torah, and it's even included in the Ten Commandments. Yet that still leaves a question. Why do we need to keep this day of rest in the first place? On the one hand, we keep Shabbat because God said so. This is how we show trust, by trusting even when it is difficult, and even when it may not make sense at the time. That being said, there are also many other reasons and purposes for Shabbat and Judaism. In Exodus 31, 13, God says to Israel, Surely you must keep my Shabbat, for it is a sign between me and you throughout the generations. So what does it mean for Shabbat to be a sign? One night before bed, I was having a minor panic attack because my sermon wasn't ready yet. And actually, I had barely even started it. And, but I, I knew I wanted to talk about Shabbat, and I wanted to use this verse, but I didn't really understand what it meant. So as I was laying in bed, this idea came to me. I realized that to know how Shabbat is a sign, we first need to define a sign. A sign directs you what way to go. So it's not that God was worried that we would work too hard and gave us a day of rest so we wouldn't burn out. Shabbat is a signpost that is supposed to remind us about what's most important and point us towards that goal. The MDRC wrote, Shabbat is for Jews a constant reminder that we are the people whom the creator of heaven and earth redeemed from slavery in Egypt. If we cannot make room for Shabbat in our busy schedules, we prove that the fact of our slavery has not changed, only its location. As Ahad Ha'am said, it is not the Jews who kept Shabbat, it is Shabbat who kept the Jews. Now that we have some interesting ideas on why, let's look into what. In Genesis, God has just created the world, and then he ceases from all his work, and he rests. In Exodus, God commands us to do the same thing, to cease from our work and rest just as he rested back in Genesis. But even more than just being told to rest on Shabbat, the Torah adds more restrictions such as do not buy or sell, do not travel, carry a burden, do laborious work, or light a flame. This brings up an interesting question. How do these restrictions help us rest? First, we have to define rest. When we think of rest, we think of it as a negative action, not doing something. Rest is the absence of work. But I believe rest, at least in the context of Shabbat, should be seen as a positive action. Rest isn't the absence of something. Rest is something in and of itself. Rabbi Yankee Tuber gave the example of a young boy who is learning to swim. The boy asks if he can play a board game while swimming. The swim instructor tells him, no, you can't play a board game in the pool. The boy asks about riding his bike, wearing his cowboy boots, playing a video game, and eating a snack. Of course, the answers were all no. You can't do any of these things while swimming. Finally, the young boy leaves in disgust. What's the point of swimming anyway? It's just a bunch of you're not allowed. Of course, that's all ridiculous. Swimming isn't a bunch of you're not allowed. Swimming is a positive action. To do that activity, you must stop all other things that interfere with that action. Shabbat is the same way. To enter into Shabbat, we have to stop everything that will interfere with our rest. This goes even further if we look at the Hebrew of the passage. On Shabbat, we are commanded to refrain from work. The Hebrew word for work is avodah, which refers to work as we understand it in English, our job, labor, or physical work. This is the kind of work you need to stop and take a breather from. But the Hebrew in Exodus 31, where we are commanded to stop work on Shabbat, it's a different word. The word is malacha. To find out what malacha means, we have to see where it's first used. Genesis 2.2. On the seventh day, God completed his malacha that he made, and he ceased from all his malacha that he had made. So malacha is what God did when he created the world. Malacha is like the creative action of forming and shaping things when we build or tinker and continually make things better and more and more finished. Finishing is the purpose or the goal. But if you never stop creating and tinkering, there's no way to relate to the object you made. You never finish. So while rest from avodah work is taking a breather, a nap, or a vacation, and while the Torah does tell us to stop avodah work on Shabbat, by not selling, buying, carrying, lighting fires, etc. Shabbat is really a rest from Malachah work, the work God did when he created the world. 
Rest from malacha work is where positive rest comes in. The same way a painter must stop painting before he can sit back and appreciate the painting he has just created, we are called to stop creating so that we can really live and appreciate God's creation that we are living in. Now let's talk about who, because I think it connects in an interesting way. If we think about who, who is Shabbat for? Shabbat was actually first made for God, a time for him to stop his work to relate to what he had made. This can help explain the reason for, Shab for God's Shabbat in the first place. He's an all-powerful God, so it doesn't make sense that he would need a breather after creating the world. God made for himself a day of Shabbat so that he could appreciate and relate to what he had created. Now in Exodus, we see something amazing. God gave his Shabbat to us. He's not telling us to take a nap or a vacation. God is telling us to enter into his life with him. I want to share one last idea that came to me from my Besorah passage about what is Shabbat really about. In my readings, Luke 14, 1 through 11, Yeshua goes to have dinner with the leader of the Pharisees on Shabbat. While he's there, a sick man comes to Yeshua, and Yeshua heals him. Instead of rejoicing, however, that this man was healed, the Pharisees and leaders get angry at Yeshua, thinking he has just broken Shabbat. One way to read this passage is saying that Yeshua doesn't value Shabbat. I think Yeshua is actually doing the opposite. He is trying to help the Pharisees come back to the true meaning of Shabbat. Maybe Shabbat is the time for us to stop everything in our busy schedules so that we can see others around us. Seeing others, meeting their needs, and doing good is what Shabbat could really be about. I think my Haftarah passage can actually help explain this idea more. In my Haftarah passage, Ezekiel is telling Israel that they have made a mistake and left God and his commandments behind. In verse 8, Ezekiel says, the outsider has been oppressed in your midst. The orphan and the widow have been mistreated in you. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbath. What does it mean to profane God's Sabbath? The obvious answer would be to not keep Shabbat holy. But I think, and, and that's true, but I think we could get a little deeper with this. Notice the placement of the words, you have profaned my Sabbath, come directly after, the outsider has been oppressed in your midst, the orphan and the widow have been mistreated in you. So maybe one way to read these verses is that oppressing the outsider and mistreating the orphan and the widow is what profanes Shabbat. So going back, if Yeshua had the ability but did not heal that man, he would have profaned Shabbat. So how does this affect our lives today? If we always continue to rush through life, absorbed in our own lives, when will we stop to notice others around us? Shabbat is a time to invite someone to our home who is alone, to pray for healing when we see a need, and to be part of the lives of the people in our community. Shabbat has always been something very important in our family life, and Shabbat has become something very special to me. Growing up, Shabbat was always my favorite day of the week. Friday night meant a lively Shabbat dinner, usually with guests coming over, and a relaxed evening talking and laughing as a family. Saturday meant going to synagogue, learning in Shabbat school, and seeing friends. And Saturday evening was always a relaxed family time, sometimes taking a walk, reading books, playing board games, and a lively Havdalah to close Shabbat. However, although Shabbat was always a peaceful family experience, the times when we were not at synagogue, we were less careful about Shabbat observance at home. As I got older, I started thinking more about this and Shabbat observance, what it means and how it's done in different communities. I started doing research, and as I learned more, I felt convicted that we could enter into Shabbat more fully as a family. And since I was getting closer to my bat mitzvah, I felt this was something that I wanted to do on my own initiative. And when I initiated, the rest of my family wanted to join in too. We worked together to change little things in our Shabbat for example, I started making a point to look up when Shabbat began and ended each week so that we would know when we needed to finish cleaning, cooking, and Shabbat preparations instead of basing all this on when it was convenient. As my sister Shira wisely said, don't try to fit Shabbat into your week. Frame your week around Shabbat. When I started guarding Shabbat more carefully with the small things, I was able to enter more deeply into the spirit of Shabbat 
with positive rest, and instead of feeling like Shabbat was just a burden, I began to feel closer to the real meaning of Shabbat and more rested each week. A couple weeks later, we learned from some friends about a homeschool co-op that puts, for middle and high schoolers that puts on main stage production musicals. I love acting and singing, and so I was so excited. This felt like the perfect opportunity. And then we found out that this co-op performs on Friday evening and Saturday afternoon, right on Shabbat. I felt torn between my convictions about Shabbat and how much I wanted to be a part of this co-op. Part of me was saying, it's just one Shabbat a year, just make the exception. But later, as I was praying about it, I felt convicted again. I had wanted to be more Shabbat observant, and yet as soon as things got hard, I was ready to back out. To be honest, I'm still a little torn, even though I know inside what I feel like God is calling me to do. I know there are always exceptions, and this isn't always one right answer for everyone, but the reason I'm telling this story is because I think what's most important is feeling the tension and wrestling with these questions. Because otherwise, Shabbat is only Shabbat if I want it to be, or it's only Shabbat when it's convenient, and then it doesn't mean anything. To summarize this message, some ideas about Shabbat that we unpack today is the idea of Malachah versus Avodah. Shabbat, for God, is about stepping back and relating to what he has made, and for us as people, relating to God as our creator. We also saw Shabbat as a signpost that directs us closer to God, and we saw the idea that rest isn't a negative, but actually a positive action. To conclude, I hope this message helped you see Shabbat a little differently than before, and maybe you will find a way to keep Shabbat even better in your life as well. Shabbat Shalom. Yasha Koch again to Aviva. Uh, literary agents with book deals would be, would be advised to wait until after Shabbat.